Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. In this show, which takes place every Sunday, almost every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go through the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my game. Uh, in this case, I am running a Waterdeep Dragon Heist game, uh, Sundays at noon. So I run the show, and I prep for the game, and we chat about D&D, and then I've got notes uh, about D&D. If you are not familiar with the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, I have a series of, I have a bunch of things for you. Uh, first, uh, I have a series of videos that go over, that has an overview of all eight steps, uh, plus one video that goes in deep into each step. Deep is in five or 10 minutes, five, somewhere between five and 15 minutes, depending on the step. Uh, and also there is a free preview of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, which includes uh, the chapter of uh, the outline, uh, the Lazy Dungeon Master checklist, which also describes the eight steps. So if you're not familiar with either of those, you can take a look at those. In this show, I assume you're already familiar because uh, you can always go look at those and then come and watch the show later. Uh, the show is also posted to YouTube. If you're on Twitch, it's also posted to YouTube. And all the links for all this stuff is below, both on YouTube and on Twitch. So you can see all that stuff there. So, uh, if you are in chat on Twitch, please say hello. Uh, I can never tell how many people are online. That, you'd think that would be something I could tell. But I don't know what I'm doing, really. So, hard to say. Does the video producer tell me this thing? I don't know. Creator dashboard. I don't know what all these things are. It says I have eight viewers. So, that's cool. Uh... Looks like eight of us. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, lots of people saying hello. That's very great. So, yeah. Uh, so last week, I ran an adventure called Blue Alley. Um, Blue Alley is a uh, DM's Guild Adept adventure uh, written by uh, M.T. Black and Alan Patrick, two veterans to adventure writing. Uh, M.T. Black has uh, put out a whole bunch of... Uh, excellent adventures on the DMs Guild. He's a real DMs Guild success story, and he was picked up for the Guild Adept program based on his uh, long list of popular adventures. Uh, and Alan Patrick has been part of the organized play program for a long time, and uh, he wrote it as well. So this is... Uh, Blue Alley is a death trap dungeon in the middle of Waterdeep. Uh, it's built around the idea that an old wizard uh, put together a test of some sorts in which characters must uh, go through a complicated uh, alleyway and face all kinds of tricks and traps and uh, challenges and puzzles uh, in order to acquire a, a celestite unicorn. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, a fancy jeweled unicorn. And then once they have the unicorn, uh, they then have to get out. Um, my group was, so, so in previous, uh, if you've been following this series, uh, that I've been doing, my group, uh, is in the middle of chapter two of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, and as chapter two is likely to do, they have gone completely off the rails. Um, so, um... They've gone completely off the rails, and uh, I've been throwing all kinds of different things in there. So they had all sorts of adventures dealing with the rival tavern owner, and they um, uh, they met uh, J.B. Nevercott, uh, who is from Luskin uh, on the ship, the Sea Maiden's Fair. I screwed that up. I think Sea Maiden's Fair is actually the fair, and there's, there's ship names, but whatever. Now the Sea Maiden's Fair is the name of the ship. That's what we do when we screw up in D&D. So... Um, uh, they met with him and they were dealing with that and they had like some poisons that they were moving around and they had sort of all these little sub threads that were going on. And I know that the players were all like the, 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 the table conversation and the sort of after, you know, the, the banter, uh, at, at the shop, uh, after we were done was kind of like, the hell are we doing? You know, like, I don't know what's going on. And like, there's fun and things are happening and stuff, but. I don't know what's going on. So they're kind of ready. So when Blue Alley fell in place, and I kind of threw these seeds and rumors that if you want money for your establishment, Blue Alley is the place to get it. But, you know, you're gonna, you're probably going to get killed. They were like, oh, that's awesome. We're going there. So they were super eager to go to, like, anything that was specific and that had, like, you know, walls. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, so that's real tricky. Uh, 
Calth I should bump my font size if I can't read this. Damn. Uh, my eyesight is going. Uh, Kaltha says, I get to enjoy starting chapter two soon. Starting the next session with Grumshar fight. I don't remember the Grumshar. I don't remember the Grumshar fight. You have to remind me. Um, yeah, I got lots of recommendations for chapter two. It's a big, wide open chapter. So one thing I would do is, and I'm, I'm writing an article on this, but I want to finish chapter two before I actually write an article about it. Um, uh, I'll give you a, a, a little secret background on Sly Flourish, which is uh, I don't I don't try to write timely articles because I want articles to last forever. So if it takes me months to write an article about chapter two, that's perfectly fine because if it dies because of timeliness, like, oh, no one's playing it anymore, then it, sh it doesn't matter if I ever wrote it, frankly. If I don't, I'm not looking for lots of hits on an article right now. I'm looking for people to find articles useful for many years. And an example of that is um, my articles on, uh, uh, what's it called? Horde of the Dragon Queen. I wrote a series of articles that outline each of the chapters in Horde of the Dragon Queen. They are still some of the highest ranking articles on Sly Flourish, five years, uh, basically five years after they come out. It's where the party rescues Floon from the, oh yeah, 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 Grumshar. The uh, Grumshar is the Archmage of the Undermountain, uh, uh, Archmage of, Archmage of the Undercity, as I refer to him, who cast vicious spells like Power Word Firebolt. Um, yeah, that was a fun, that was a really good session. In fact, I started my session the same way. I started my session with a Grumshar fight and then it went on from there. And that was that was a lot of fun. So I really like that. And that's kind of the way this adventure operates. It's it's if you think about how the structure of like Tomb of Annihilation was, uh, Tomb started with like you hanging out in a city doing a bunch of city stuff, although that was relatively unstructured too. And then suddenly you're out in the wide open and you can travel across this huge island full of swamps for months at a time. And then uh, all of a sudden it narrows back down again when you get to Omu and you can kind of go around Omu in a bunch of different ways. And then it super narrows down when you're just doing the tomb itself. The Tomb of the Nine Gods. So that, that structure of sort of narrow and then wide and then narrow. Uh, Chris Estrade does the same thing. It's got, um, you know, you, if, you, if you run it in my preferred way, you run it with Death House first, which is a dungeon, you know, a, a, not a dungeon. It's a haunted house in the middle of um, uh, Barovia, the village of Barovia. And then you go out to Barovia Village and you deal with stuff there. And then you start going on the road and then it becomes this wide open thing. And the next thing you know, it narrows back down when you get to the castle. So it's an interesting sort of adventure structure that, that exists in um, these big hardback adventures. So uh, Dragon Heist does kind of the same thing um, in that it starts really narrow with uh, chapter one. Um, I think the only other issue I have with chapter one is like it takes you forever to level. Like I think I leveled people right after the bar fight. You know, so I got them to level two right away. And then as soon as they were two, I kind of let them stay at two for a while um, as they did all of the rest of chapter one. And then, so that's a, I think I had that in my recommendation on how to run chapter one, which is level them up to two. Don't, 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 they, they, they do so much stuff in that chapter, you know, and having to go through like Kenku fights and, you know, you, you do a fight in, if you just think about combat, right? You're doing a battle at the, um, uh, you, you do a battle at the uh, Yawning Portal. Then you do a battle with the Kenkus. There might be random encounters on the way. Then you have sort of sewer encounters and there's a bunch of sewer encounters. And then you fight like another boss. Like that's, you know, at level one, like level one should be, you know, a stern conversation and a, bat with a, a fight with a giant rat. Like that to me is the definition of like a level one, a level one, um, adventure. Uh, I'm actually working on a level one adventure right now. I play tested it yesterday and uh, it's about two hours long. You know, it's a short, it's a short adventure designed to get you to level two. And it's got like maybe three encounters, maybe four. It's got four encounters, um, you know, two of which could be, uh, and my account, you know, two potential combat encounters. Um, Four potential combat encounters, but two of them often end up in conversations. In fact, in both mine, they, they ended up as a conversation, so it worked out really well. Um, uh, yeah, Kenku fight, you have to have a city watch because max damage on short bow. Yeah, right. People drop at level one. That's why I think getting them to two, I would get them to two quickly. If you want, if you take anything away, here's your key uh, at, you know, 11 minutes into the show. If you do anything when you're running Waterdeep Dragon Heist, uh, first thing is level them up. 
early. Level him up right after Yawning Portal. Let him do the Yawning Portal thing. Let him have the conversations and then give him level two and let them do the rest of chapter one at level two. It's not going to unbalance anything. It's actually going to be a lot more fun. You can relax a little bit, not worry about killing with a single Kenku shot. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in chapter one and, and you can, you can you know, you can really level them up quickly. So um, that would be one recommendation. So then you go to chapter two and chapter two is wide open and it's got like, tw- I think it's, I counted them. It's like 28 potential side quests just for factions. So one thing you do is decide which factions you're going to incorporate, you know? And in my case, I, I pretty much took out the basic five except for the Zinterim because the Zinterim got there. But I like the idea of the Xanathar, and I don't think the Xanathar Guild, they don't actually show up. But Brigand Arth does, and, and uh, limiting Brigand Arth to just Drow didn't make much sense for me either. So I let Brigand Arth recruit the characters, even though uh, they're not Drow. Because one of them was a Drow, and that doesn't matter. So um, what I recommend there is reading through the side quests and deciding which ones grab your attention, which ones sound cool, and then focus on those side quests. And if you play the way I am, they're level three by the time they get to chapter two. You know, they level at, after the Yawning Portal, and then they level after the fight with um, Grumshar at the end of chapter one. So now they're third level. And then you can run pretty much any of those side quests can work at level three. Uh, you know, some of them are tuned to like level one and two and three and four, uh, but they all work. So if you like them, go ahead and run those chapters. That, 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 that works well. Um, that worked well for me anyway. Uh, but then I focused those things down. And then it's also your place to throw in other side quests. But what I found from chapter two is that it's really separate from the rest of the story of the adventure and the players know it. And they're kind of like, why are we doing this stuff? Uh, I talked to uh, Enrique Bertrand. We had, he and I had a show where we talked about this. I think you can see it on YouTube. It's on, it's on the Sly Flourish channel on YouTube. And uh, he mentioned that like his players were grabbing onto these side quests and running with them, thinking that they were part of the storyline. And he had to like basically step back and be like, this isn't actually part of the story. And they're like, why are we doing all this? So it can get frustrating because there's a lot of side quests that don't really have anything to do with the dragons. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then in my case, I just to give the, I like to give options to the players. I like them to have ways to go. So I threw Blue Alley out there as sort of a, you know, you can do it or not. And and honestly, my players, a bunch of my players are used to running Adventures League stuff. They, they both run and play Adventures League. Um, at least two of them do. So they're kind of used to being, uh, having a heavy structure in their adventures. And they're like, man, there's way more side quests than we're ever going to complete. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's fine. Go pick the ones you like. You're like, don't worry. He's like, oh, but my completionist, I want to check all the boxes. I'm like, you're not going to be able to check all the boxes. These things are going to go away. So like they did a job for, uh, what's her name? The Black Spider. Is the Black Spider? No. I'm not getting it right. Let's take a look. Let's go up to my nice blue alley cover here. And let's go to here. Uh, I forget in Dragon Heist uh, who the, uh, where's NPC? There's NPCs. Somebody's going to tell me. Uh, no, it's the, um, uh, the, the rogue lady, the noble. She's like a noble thief. The Black Viper. I was close. So uh, they met the Black Viper. But I don't know if she's ever going to come back again. You know, like she, they did a job for her and then she kind of went away. So I th- I'd like to bring her back because she's pretty cool. But they just met her once. And then, you know, we'll see, you know, we'll see what they, uh, we'll see whether or not she comes back into play. She could be a fun NPC that sort of comes in on a perpendicular, you know, comes in on the perpendicular. Um, so that can be fun. Anyway, so chapter two has this really wide open feel. And I think it, it's sort of a sandbox for for, play, for DMs to be able to drop in a lot of different things and sort of pick what plots you think are interesting. Um, you know, I threw in a little hag subplot in there and you can, you know, little dungeons that are going on and all that stuff. Um, and then, but the answer is as soon as things get boring, as soon as, as soon as things get frustrating, that's when you drop in the fireball. So chapter three is called Fireball. And this whole chapter starts with an explosion. And then it's a whole mystery about what happened in the explosion. And the main thing is that somebody, uh, a rock gnome spy working for Never Ember, was on his way to you guys to drop off the Stone of Galore. He kind of, you know, Never Ember had people on him. I'm making some of this up. But uh, Never, Never Ember had people on him. So he gave it to a gnome and he said, go find him. And then it looked like they were going to lose him. So then one group attacked another group. And uh, House, House Growlhund fireballed and, and killed the gnome. Uh, and then someone else stole the um, stone. So there's this whole interesting, and this is where like 
the wide open nature of chapter two gets nice and focused again. It drops right back in on what's going on. So, um, yeah, so, so chapter two, and I've, so I ran this ad adventure before when it was a play test. And I, f I found the same thing that I'm finding now, which is chapter one is nice and straightforward and clear. Chapter two is weird and wide open and you gotta, you gotta do a little work to fill it up with the things that you wanna fill it up with. Then chapter three gets back into the narrow again. And that's good, like lots of things to do. There's a cool, like uh, big part of chapter two is invading a house. If you wanna, if you think about your heist, this is sort of the heist part uh, is breaking into Growlhund Villa. Um, and sort of following these people around. And your whole point is to try to figure out what happened to this stone of galore. What is it and where did it go? And I think that um, there can be a lot of fun with this. Um, and uh, the villa itself, like one one thing, and I've, I've enjoyed, look at this, that's good. Here's a good piece of art. Uh, that's grim, huh? Look at that guy. Face is all half burned. I think that's the, is that the Zent? I think that's the Zent guy who stole the thing. Grim. Um, one of the things breaking into manners is actually a really fun model in a D&D adventure. And I did this on what last Wednesday. Um, I'm running a Shadow of the Demon Lord game, and they had already escaped from a house of somebody that they knew was a um, uh, member of uh, the uh, Cult of Shadow. Cult, yeah, the Cult of Shadow, I think they are. They're the ones trying to bring the Demon Lord to the world. And um, I said, like, well, the Cult of Shadow has, like, information about how they're trying to bring the Demon Lord in and, and the ritual that they're conducting and the things that can stop the ritual. And you have to break into the house and get it. And I left them. I, I built a nice Dwarven Forge house using my village and tower sets. And then I built a little underground place. And I kind of I, I put some interesting places in there and put guards around it. And I said, you guys go go to town. So they got to choose how they were going to break into this place and deal with it. Are they going to sneak in? Are they going to fight their way in? And um, you can do the same thing with this, with Growlhund, you know, that the Growlhund Villa is a, um, you know, how they, how they break in. Uh, where's the map? Let's get a nice map here. Um, you know, Growlhund Villa is this nice two-story walled place. Uh, this would be a cool map to, to, to print out on a big poster. If you can afford it, if you can do it, maybe I might, I might do that. That might be cool. But you're only gonna use it once. I don't know. I mean, I guess you could use this all the time. This is one you could use over and over again. Uh, because it's a pretty great, it's a pretty great map. I don't know. Maybe I'll print this one out. I found out there's a Kinko's right near me, so I can, I can print, I can print things out. Uh, I think I actually tried to build this in Dwarven Forge. I built it. I did. I built. I built it using my castle set, which I don't really use that often, and my um, tower sets. And it was fun. Like it was. A, I think it was two sessions, and they had to break in, and they had to fight a bunch of dudes, and it was really neat. The only problem is like, you, you always think of a heist like Ocean's Eleven, and like everybody's well coordinated, and all the plans are going. And and a lot of times like the players are are you know counter to one another. <laughs> like well, two guys are trying to negotiate at one gate, and someone else is murdering the people in the back, and. You know, things go, always go wild. So I always try to go a little easy with like the reactions of the people. Like g given the, uh, the the lack of coordination of, of my players sometimes, I'm going to give an equal lack of coordination to the people that are in the manor. So it's not like all the bad guys show up at the front door. It's like, no, they're confused too. So, um, you know, that, 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 works, that works well for me. Um, anyway, so this is all part of chapter three, but I'm not running chapter three today. I am running Blue Alley. Uh, so in the last session, let me pull up my notes here. We'll go to Sublime. If anybody has any questions about this in chat, feel free to feel free to chat. It's been quiet. Everyone's drinking their coffee. Um, so they ended the session. Uh, do I have the map? You know, I gotta go download. I think I did this before. Let me see if it's in my downloads directory. Uh, Blue Alley. Uh, yeah, okay, let me get this, show in folder, stick this here, whoops, all right, oh, it's big, oh, great big thing, wow, I'm using a lot of RAM. Oh 
man. Maybe that was a mistake. Oh, there we go. Yay. So here's the map. And um, this, so Blue Alley, when it reached certain points in the, um, uh, when it reached certain points in its sails, when Blue Alley, the adventurer, hit certain sails, they made a full color map that's really big and, you know, full ready for your VTTs and stuff like that. And I brought my iPad. I'm going to do it again, right? I have, an, I have this on an iPad so I can show, I can like zoom in on the map and kind of show them what's going on. And uh, they took to the right-hand side. So they dealt with all this. And I'll tell you, man, they had a hard time with this adventure. So they got to the book and got lightning bolted by the book. Like, they got blasted by, uh, they, 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 a guy wanted to steal the book. And he grabbed the book and it blew up with a um, ward, uh, a glyph of warding. I, I lowered the glyph to 3D8 instead of 5D8. And that blasted him. He's like, oh my God. And then he got up and he grabbed the book again and tried to do it again. And he got hit with another 3D8 blast and that knocked him down. So he was down already before they even got through the first alley. <laughs> At least one guy was. Oh, I only had three players then too. So there were three players coming through this. Um, so they, they kind of got hit by every trap they faced. They went to the right. Um, they went through these rooms. If you want to know what all this stuff is, I'm not going to go over the whole thing here. Uh, go buy Blue Alley. It's not, I think it's $5. And you can, um, you can, you can read it. Um, it's best when run clockwise. My table went counterclockwise and some of the scenes didn't make sense. If I had to do it again, I would mirror the layout. Interesting. So my group is doing it. Um, are they doing it clockwise? They are doing it clockwise. So they, they made the right choice. That's interesting. Uh, Native DM says Blue Alley works best when run clockwise because other things don't make sense. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't run it the other way, so I don't know. Uh, uh, having trouble to zoom on this. So uh, they went over the spike pit and they got hit by that like twice. Like one guy, one guy like literally leapt into it. He's like, I jump in. And I'm like, you, how was your strength? He's like 10. I'm like, you get 10 feet out and you fall. This like, ah, and then he's like, wait, could we just crawl down and walk through him? Like, yeah. And he's like, okay, I do that. And the next guy hops up on the other side and all the spikes go bang. And he <laughs> hit him like, oh God, I got hit again by the same spikes. So they went in here and they fought a bunch of stuff. I don't I think it was skeletons in here. Um, and then made it into the room and they got the celestial unicorn. So this took the whole session for them to get here. Oh no, and then they, they made it out and they got through here and they, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, this is, where's the room with the celestial unicorn? They, they made it up to, they're right here in this part of the alley. Uh, this is, I don't even know, hang on, Let me pull up my, I don't have a DM version. Um, boop. Uh, they made it, yeah, to halt this hallway, uh, and they're heading into room twenty-six. So, and then they, and then they're probably going to make their way back. But the funny thing is, they have to kind of make their way all the way back, get some stuff here. They can't actually leave the alley. I don't think. I can't remember if they can leave the alley or not. Um. So uh, they got a bunch of trickery, but then they've got like the platforms that they got to jump over. Uh, I think they found all these rooms and they dealt with everything on the right-hand side. So everything on the way out is on the left-hand side. Um, and uh, even though I've read the adventure, I've read all that stuff, I forget it all. So I always have to do it again. You know, I, I always have to kind of read it again. But um, yeah, so it's this one's a little easier than the last one because I know exactly where it's going to start. And that's, you know... Um, Blue Alley. Escape from Blue Alley, right? Whatever players, whatever characters were not there are suddenly there. Their memories are hazy. They're like, I don't know how I got here, but they somehow got here and they all they remember is danger. Uh, that has to do with evil wizards kind of blank in their mind. Um, so that's, you know, the strong start is pretty, pretty easy. I don't, maybe I'll throw some, throw some monsters at them or something. You know, what, what could, what could attack them here? That would be interesting. Why don't we go to the lazy DM workbook and drop an encounter and see what happens. Um, 
we will go to, if you have not seen the Lazy DM workbook, it is the companion book to Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, built for 5th edition, and it includes a bunch of resources to help run games, like traps and monuments and items and town events. And then my D and DM, uh, my old DMG style. Uh, so the dungeon level they're on is really kind of dungeon level three, we'll say. That makes sense. And then we roll a 20 and we rolled a nine. And a nine is on table one. And on table one, they face 12, which are dretches. I think some dretches would be cool. Uh, let's look up dretch. Dretches are kind of crawling through. Oh, they're so nasty. Oh, they got lots of hit points and fetid clouds. They don't do a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, eight points of damage. Uh, they are CR one quarter. So how many dretches make sense for a third level party? Quite a few. If we go back to the Lazy DM workbook and we look up challenges, uh, they are characters second to fourth level. The challenge rating uh, is one quarter level. Let's see. Um, so they are third level. So one tenth would be one third. So these guys are actually, so you could do two monsters per character. So they could do, supposedly do like 10 dretches or, you know, two dretches per, but we'll probably do, cause this, we don't want to do like a hard fight. That would be considered a hard fight. So we're going to drop um, probably one dretch per character. Um, I'll tell you, that's a much easier, if, you, if, if, you, if you're into encounter balance and like trying to figure out how many monsters are appropriate, you can use Cobalt Fight Club for something like that, but I try to keep my like really loose, this, this loose table over here, right? You, you figure out what level your characters are, and then you figure out if the challenge rating is equal to some ratio of the character level, it tells you how many monsters are appropriate for that many characters. So an example is if you have a, uh, if you have level three characters, four, let's say we got four level three, we'll do an easy one, four level three characters, and you have a CR three monster, uh, a CR3 monster would be like a sea hag, right? I'm pretty sure a sea hag is CR3. Um, oh, there's CR2. So slightly low, slightly, ooh, death glare. What's that? Sea hags, cool. Um, uh, you can generally figure out like how many monsters are appropriate for the characters given the challenge rating of the monster compared to the character's level. That's kind of a hard... You know, it's a hard thing to get down, but you can basically use this chart to figure that out. And if you think about like, okay, so I said that 10 dretches would be hard. Pro that's probably bordering on deadly for um, four level three characters. Let's see what Cobalt Fight Club. Let's see what Cobalt Fight Club says. Cobalt Fight Club actually does the math for you. So people are like, I mean, dretch one, and we're going to say... 10 dretches, four characters of level three. Yep, so right, I, I figured it out and it says it's hard. So I was right about that, right? So my, my math, the math I use actually fits the math that, that the actual one uses. I just don't have to go through all the experience point conversion and all that stuff. All I have to do is look at this little table and figure out the ratio, if that makes any sense. Um, let's see, we got a couple questions in chat here. Uh, just ran a session with the checklist on Friday. One question, how long ahead of your sessions do you do your prep? I did the prep Sunday and I ran the game Friday and I worried the time between could have been detrimental. Yeah, there, there's, you, I, I find that the closer I do my prep to the game, the better. And that probably isn't surprising. Um, like I'm doing my prep right now for a game I'm going to be running in an hour and a half. So, and I've not even thought about it all week. So the closer you can get it to your game, the better. Now, if you, if you have the bulk of your time way earlier than your game, then what you can do is write all your notes down, write down your secrets, go through the process. And this is just my suggestion. This isn't doctrine or mantra or anything like, you know, anything like that. Um, but what I would do is, um, I would do all of my prep when I have the time to do it. And then I would review it before the game. So even if you only have 10 or 15 minutes before your game is going to begin, sit down, put the phone away, unless the phone is how you're reading your notes, but put all your distractions away. Try to try to isolate yourself as much as you can and look over your notes again. Go through the steps again, only this time you have it all in front of you. Think about the characters, think about the secrets, think about the start, 
you know, think about the locations, kind of work it back into your brain and move it from long-term to short-term memory. Um, you know, this is that sort of cramming right before finals thing, right? And um, and then you've got it in your short-term memory, and then when you're playing, it's a little better. Uh, yesterday, I had a kind of an interesting experience where I'm, I was playtesting an adventure that I wrote, and I've written and edited this adventure two or three times at this point, and I thought to myself, I don't need to prep it because I've written it, right? Like, I wrote the adventure, and it's not just prep. I wrote, like, 5,000 words. So I'm like, I don't really need to prep it. And I didn't prep it. And then I got there and I kind of forgot what I had written in the words. So I had it there and I was still able to run it and I still remembered stuff. But it was like, it would have helped if I kind of went through it again. And it didn't help that I was introducing both a town and an adventure kind of at the same time. So I was jumping between these two different text documents where I had all this stuff. Um, so I think the answer to that is uh, if you can, uh, you, you know, get your prep done whenever you can. This is my, rec in my thought, right? I would get my prep done whenever I can. And then I would try to spend at least 10 or 15 minutes reviewing it right before, um, uh, right before the game begins. Uh, yeah, closer to the session is as good as you can get. Uh, I'm big prep the night before guy. Uh, Evil John says preps the night before. Uh, Water Dragon Heist from the Beatles and Grim Platinum Edition. And the best thing about it was, man, yeah, I'm kind of kicking myself for not having it. Although I'm very excited to have the Silver Edition for... Um, for the next book of adventures. I think that's gonna be really cool. Uh, think about having the module sliced up into smaller physical booklets made prep seem way easier and more focused and manageable. Yeah, because you're not well, yeah, going around the great big book. Um, yeah, isolating distractions is hard for everybody. I was actually thinking a lot about that this week, um, particularly with you know kind of deeper writing. I, I, don't, I don't think that prep should take a long time, but writing D&D stuff does. And I know that I'm terrible at isolating distraction, isolating myself when I'm writing. I try, like even when I'm taking time off to go write something. I did this last March, this past month. And still like every 10 or 15 minutes, I'm like, oh, what's going on on Twitter? And I really needed to break away from the social networks and stuff like that and, and really focus on, on this stuff. And I'm gonna do it this afternoon too. I'm doing some heavy editing this afternoon and I need to isolate myself to do it. And I think the same is true when we're prepping our, prepping our game and reading material. Uh, I've been pouring over material from um, uh, pouring over material from Shadow of the Demon Lord because I just I love the setting and I'm enjoying the campaign I'm writing there, and um, so I've been reading a lot of the books and I find that what I want to do is grab my iPad where I have all the PDFs of it and sit on the couch and turn on some nice music that doesn't have any words in it, usually video game music, and sit back and read and and just really read and enjoy these these books right and. Like, what am I getting from reading, you know, 500 tweets a day? Like, there's a few tweets that are really interesting and good. And I get a lot out of social network, a lot of value out of social network stuff and conversations that are going on there. But many times I need to separate myself and I need to go and, and dive deep. And, and that, that concept of deep work is something I'm thinking more and more about and something I don't, I'm not particularly good at and I want to get better. Uh, what else? Yeah, so... They're gonna escape from Blue Alley. They're gonna attack by Dretches. Horrid. Maybe, in a, yeah, Dretches and a Laughter. Um, do we know anything about who made uh, Blue Alley? Killier, Killier. Yeah, I'm trying to remember, like, you know, the history of the place. Is there other history and background that is worth um, throwing in here? Um, Reclusive mage from Waterdeep named Kierler constructed Blue Alley for his own amusement, filled it with rich treasures and deadly traps and enticing adventures. Um... I like the idea he buys back his own unicorn so he can put it in for everybody else. Uh, that's kind of fun. Episode three, wrap up. The adventurers escape from Blue Alley but are faced with a dilemma. What dilemma are they faced with? I don't know that. Uh, 
Someone has a celestial unicorn begin speaking to them telepath. Oh. Ah, cool. The unicorn is real. Uh. Let's see. So that that'd be another strong start. That, that, that's a cool secret, right? That that um, the unicorn is real. Uh, what would free it? I think probably a greater restoration. <laughs> I'm very curious. I don't know how hard this is going to be. My my players are pretty quick. Like, oh, yeah, that's your problem. We're going to sell you. Um, you know, I don't know if they're going to save her or not. Uh, let's see. I usually read the module and prep the potential combats ahead of time with Fight Club, then review the material of the day. Yeah, that's not a bad way to go. Whatever works, man. You know, the, the thing about return, like I, I write the, 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 the checklist. The checklist works really well for me and people like it, I think, because it's a nice structure and it doesn't completely drop the ball. It's a structure that, that works. Um, but everybody can tailor it and customize it for their own use. And I think that that's really valuable. And, um, uh, and a lot of people have their own systems that work really well for them. But I think people like to have a system, you know, we in this wide open world of D&D &D where you can do anything you want and anything can happen in any direction in a game. Like, look how much, I mean, God, we're writing millions and millions and millions of words about D&D &D every day. Maybe not every day. I don't know. It's probably a lot. And because uh, it's wide open. So having some little ladder, it's just like the player, right? Players wanted structure in their game. They got frustrated when they weren't sure what they were doing or why. And, and they, they had too many options. DMs are the same way. It's like too many options aren't good. We need, we need focused options. And that's why I think a, a nice checklist works well. You know, if I, all I, you know, if I'm worried about my game, do the checklist, right? Like I don't have to think about it. And that's, that's really nice. Checklist. There's a whole science behind checklists and how it saves people's lives and stuff like that. So it's worth digging into. Um, what am I, what am I broadcasting here? Okay. So I'm broadcasting the right stuff. Uh, although that's a boring ass picture. Let's, let's change that picture up. Let's go back to, yeah, look at that guy. Oh, grim. I think I could throw, ooh, alley. Uh, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> Blue Alley, bang, okay. So now, I'm just trying to get my windows open here. Yeah, so, um, and in fact, we can, that's the black and white one. Whoops, oh Christ, oh no. What did I do? Don't worry, it'll all show up here in a second. Hey, there all it is. Huge. Oh, what is this now? Oh my God. It's these huge images. I need to can, can get smaller ones so I can display them. Um, it's as small as it goes. We'll go with that. Uh, what else was I talking about? I forget. Anyway, working on my secrets. Uh, so I got five secrets. What other interesting secrets? Uh, what what else could occur? Um, has and what else has been going on while the characters have been dorking around in Blue Alley? What what there might be secrets that the other characters have figured out while they were running around. Um, 
maybe it's time to uh, bring in the fact that uh, uh, so we had the family, the Grauhans. Uh, originally, was it Rhaegar? What's his name? Yeah, Rhaegar, right? There's a few secrets about the Growlhuns and the Castellanters, which I think is, you know, kind of what I'm digging into. Is there any other secrets with um, Jarlaxle and that house? I don't think so. Uh, so I think this might be information that Pat's character knows. So. There's 10 secrets. Raynar, it might be more tied to the adventure to ask who could cast greater restoration for them. Yes, right. So they might they might figure that out. I mean, they're they're going to learn this, but what, what they do with that information, uh, they're going to have to figure out. So I think the idea that Kyler, Kyler the wizard, um, might show up and be like, you know, man, that was fun watching you guys go through. By the way, I want my unicorn back. And if they like, he's like, I'll give you 500 gold for that unicorn. And if they're like, more. And he's like, no, I could just kill you and take it. I'm being nice. Give me the unicorn for 500. 500 gold's good. Um, and then we'll go be a magic item. So one of my players loves magic items. That's what he wants are magic items. Um, any other interesting NPCs? I don't think so. I got nobody in mind. I made a separate NPC list. Uh, and then I think, did I give any of this away? I don't think I gave any of these. I'm trying to remember if they got any of these items. They got something. They got the bardic instrument. Uh, and I'm going to have to figure that out, the banjo. Um, and I'm tempted to change the spell list that the banjo can do. Uh, so it's a magical banjo that's built like a instrument of the bards. Uh, let's go over here. Um, I got all the wrong things going on here. So the instrument of a bards, it's a, it, it so they're, they have, they're uncommon magic items, right? But wow, they are freaking powerful. Um, cause they cast fly, fly, invisibility, levitate, protection from good and evil. I mean, fly, man, that's a powerful spell. Uh, I don't know. What's the right way to drop an item like this in, on your third level characters, right? An uncommon magic item is a route right for a third level character. 
Um, but I'm thinking of changing up the, um, you know, which, which one of these, because these are all very druidic spells. Um, the mandolin might be better. Cure wounds, dispel magic, protection from energy. It's funny that that one is rare, but like these other ones, Entangle, Fairy, Fire, Shillelagh, and Speak with Animals are uncommon. I don't know what the difference is, especially when you consider that fly, invisibility, levitate, protection. From... Why do you have levitate and fly? Um, am I missing something with this? Uh, I mean, it's a lot of spells that people get on these instruments of the bards but you know it's kind of fun to drop one in and see where they go with it so i'm not gonna but i think what i might do because invisibility is a second level so they could do that is that they can't yet cast like i don't think it has fly but they'll it'll have fly when they when the uh, bard can cast um uh once the bard can cast um third level spells once they get to I guess, do you have to be fifth level before then um yeah I think we're gonna I'm gonna take that one away and I think the this dispel magic is also third right yeah man maybe that's why protection from lightning energy is third I guess it's the level of the spells where these these guys are all relatively low they're kind of boring. Um, the thing also gives charm. Um, yeah, use the action to, pl uh, to play one of the spells. Uh, but it can use all the spells. You can play the instrument while casting a spell that causes any of the target to be charmed on a failed saving throw, thereby imposing disadvantage. They get disadvantage on charm effects because of that. Um, that's powerful. Yeah. Uh, I've dropped them in campaigns before. I can't remember if somebody got one of these in my last campaign. I think they did. And I dropped it on another one, but I, I, I limited it by they could only cast spells that were of the level they were casting. So um, I think I might limit it that way, that it doesn't have these other spells on it until they can cast those spells. Like, when you're fifth level, it sort of opens up, and that's when it gives these other, these other spells. Um, uh, does that sound too, too nitpicky? It's a powerful item. Either that, I could completely change it and give it something completely different. Evil John says it sounds reasonable. Okay, I think we're going to do that. Like right now when he gets it and he, he can cast invisibility, levitate, protection from evil and good. And then when he hits third level, he will get fly, cure. Oh, and it can cast cure wounds at his level. It can cast cure wounds at second level. Um, and then when he reaches fifth level, which is going to be, uh, he'll reach fifth level before the end of the adventure because we're going we're gonna to do one level higher. So then he can cast fly, cure, dispel magic and protection from energy and it will also give him the a disadvantage on charm effects which is crazy that's a crazy powerful that's a crazy powerful item because of things like isn't hypnotic pattern a charm um yeah it's a charm effect right and it's a 30-foot cube. So disadvantage on all creatures within a 30-foot cube. Man. Of course, that's a third-level spell. You could also just fireball people. Um, at third level, the item is overpowered. At fifth level, it's just amazing. Yeah, but it's an uncommon item, which is what makes me... Anyway, so I'm going to be doing that. They're going to get the thing, but I think I'm going to limit it to... Uh, that it's sort of his school, and he's got, got to get better at it. Um, and he will learn from it. Uh, but then there's also these one-off one -off treasures that they can find uh, that I have in here. So we'll, we'll, we'll drop those in. Um, uh, what else? 
Yeah, so this so this week is an easy one because not a lot. Oh, and then the very end of the adventure is going to be the fireball. As soon as they're done with Blue Alley and they walk back, bang, the fireball is going to go off. And I'm hoping to pad out the game until that happens so that they will, um, uh, you know, so that the last scene will be the fireball. But we'll see, you know, if they get through Blue Alley quickly. Yeah, I want to end with a bang. Yeah, Evil John. And your session with the boom? Yes. So we'll see if it works out that way. Sometimes it works out that way. Sometimes it doesn't. I'll tell you an interesting thing. So running Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, I've been running the adventures so that every session is a self-contained adventure that's roughly three hours long and ends. So there's no ending in the middle of a dungeon or ending in the middle of a scene. I want the thing over so that there is a two to three day gap between sessions where the characters can go do things. And that's been a very interesting shift in how I'm thinking about the game. So they're usually very short, four to five scenes. Yeah, three hours is not a lot of time. Um, and combat does have to move. Combat in, in Shadow is pretty quick though because we the, the slow turns and fast turns and all that stuff is really, is really quick. Um, but the idea of building stories, like the next one, this is a big spoiler for my Wednesday game, um, the, the structure of the game now is they're now third level. So they're just hitting the expert path and they get three levels of four levels of expert and then four levels of master. So it's eight sessions remaining. And the way I have it is they have to gather four. There are four anchors that are bringing the demon Lord to the world. And there are four breakers, which are items that can break the anchors. You have to have a breaker to break an anchor. And there's one to one. So the next four sessions are them collecting the four breakers. And the breakers are um, a, like a, a, a splinter of, from another dimension that acts like a dagger, uh, a uh, vorpal sword, an actual vorpal sword, like Jabberwocky beheading vorpal sword, not just a D&D &D kind of vorpal sword. Um, and the, a book, an old, ancient, terrible book, and uh, a bone, a femur from the uh, from Astrid, who is like the uh, oracle of the new god. So they have to collect these four items and then use those four items to break the four anchors, which are like really powerful things. Anyway, the next one is them getting the Vorpal Sword from the Jabberwock, and they go to the fate. They're going to the land of fairy, and they have to kind of navigate through these crazy fey places. And meanwhile, the Jabberwock is walking around. The Jabberwock is like a, you know, it's from an old poem. Go, if, you, if, you, if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, go to Wikipedia and look up Vorpal Sword and look up the Jabberwocky. The Jabberwocky is the name of the poem. Um, and uh, let's see, I'll bring it up here. It's, it's a crazy poem. Uh, here's your poem. Um, this is frame, breaking frames. He took his verbal sword in hand. Long time the Max, Max and Manzome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock with eyes flame of flame came whiffing through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. Snicker snack. So um, they have to. Uh, so they're going to go there and the Jabberwock is in the woods and they have to avoid it because it's a, so the Jabberwock is actually a monster in Shadow of the Demon Lord and it's freaking powerful. It's, it's, they, you know, it is a 10th level-ish monster if you're going to use level 10. It's a master level monster. You're not supposed to be facing it at expert path and they would get killed if they do. But if they have the Vorpal Sword in hand, so they have to collect the Vorpal Sword and get out is the goal, but they'll face the Jabberwock or the Jabberwock will be there if they're not careful. And, um, and I have like these other scenes that I kind of put together, but the main thing is like, they have to go into the Fae, find the sword, collect it and leave. And that's their three hour adventure. And then the next one is the splinter. And the next one is the book. And the next one is the femur. And each of them are in these different places. Like some are otherworldly and some are here. Some they have to break into like a wizard's tower and steal. Some they have to break into a church and steal. So kind of neat situations for each of them. But all of the adventures are built on this three hour block. And then the break, breaking the anchors are going to be the same way where they have to go and find an anchor and destroy it. So they have to go find the vampire queen who uh, originally dug up the eye of the, you know, shadow. She is one of the, 
she is one of the anchors and they have to stab her with the splinter you know um the, the the splinter knight or whatever it's called and then they have to find the book and you know the book is this evil tome that that they have and and they have to you know destroy that with one of the other items i forget what the other items are maybe it's the femur um so uh yeah so there's lots of you know that the whole idea of building adventures in three hour blocks is really interesting and the idea that the characters are getting more powerful every adventure is really interesting too my group really digs it it is all shadow of the demon lord i'm talking about now um Uh, which I recommend. Um, uh, it's a fun, if you're looking for a system of particularly a fantasy horror, uh, this is a good system. And I'm, it's, it's nice to take a break. I love the combat is really quick, but still interesting. The turn system is almost so fast that sometimes you get a lot lost. Like people are like, I'm forgot. Are we in the previous round or, or what? Um, Whoops. So, um, there we go. Uh, if you want to look at the full rule set and see how it plays without necessarily like getting into it completely, uh, you can download, there's a Victims of the Demon Lord uh, book, uh, which is a, a starter guide to the system. Uh, I don't know if it's been updated though. The main book is now at a new version, uh, which mostly is cleaning up the text, you know, and there's a, a few, a few things. This is the revised edition. Um, you know, and where they, they cleaned up a lot of the text, uh, and it's probably worth picking that up. I think it's $17 for the PDF. Um, so yeah, fun system. So we're going to play that for the next eight sessions. And then by then I'm hoping, because we're, I don't think we, I think we're about gone a week or so. So it'll be nine weeks. So two and a half, three months. So I'm hoping by then to have uh, the Beetle and Grimm set. B-E-A-D-L-E. -E. The, the Salt Marsh set for, for Beetle and Grimm. Uh, You know, with cool battle maps and encounter cards, you know, a reorganized version. I think it's kind of funny. Like the idea of like, well, we reorganized it to help the dungeon master. Does that mean that like the original book is not intended to help the dungeon master? Like you'd think that, you know, I mean, I, uh, somebody who was it in chat? Was it Evil John? One of you, one of you fine folks talked about the, the Beetle and Grimm set for Dragon Heist and said that you liked having it in separate booklets. Which, who of you? Who of you talked about that? One of you did. Uh, I can't find it in the chat. I was Evil John. Okay. So it's interesting to that, that the books would be more useful in the separate booklets than it is in the main book. But I could kind of see that. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it could be interesting. And then, yeah, the idea of the encounters... And the illustrations set to put them on the on the DM screen. That sounds really cool. And then having its own, you know, its own custom DM screen is is pretty cool. So, uh, yeah. So I pre-ordered it, and I I think they said it was going to be out a couple weeks after the adventure. So it won't be out right away. And I'm a sucker because I'm I'm going to buy the collector's edition of the hardcover adventure so I can at least read it. Um, so I'm going to own this three different ways at least because I'm going to have it on Dean to beyond and I'm going to have it in the beat on grim set and I'm going to have the hardcover. So <laughs> I kind of go in all, all in with my D and D stuff. So, uh, that is today's show. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know we kind of ran around a bunch of different stuff, but since I'm running a very focused adventure on the way out, I didn't really prep prep this time is a lot easier. I tell you prepping dungeons is much easier than prepping like wide open stuff. So next week you will see a more like, Oh, where are we going from here? Um, so, uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming in the chat. Uh, I, I appreciate it. It's always uh, wonderful to talk to all of you fine folks. 
And uh, I will see all of you uh, next week. Thank you all for coming. Have a great, have a great week and go play some D&D.